All right, if you guys want to watch the rest of this, you can find it on YouTube. He's one of my favoriteest, funniest comedians these days. Okay. Programmable logic controllers. That's what we're talking about today, right? So what is it? Anybody know? Anybody look it up before coming to class? Anybody? I did. In fact, I looked it up before coming to class many, 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 many years ago. So I have an advantage over you guys. <coughs> Any automated manufacturing system. What has to happen to make it automated? Whether you're talking about the automated motion inside a CNC machine tool, you're talking about the automation of the assembly line for putting a car together. If you're talking about the motion control of a robot, what has to happen in order for all those things to, have, to work? Because they're all the same at some level. What, what's common between all those systems? Yep. All right. So, do you need a you need a control system? So you need a control system. So we need a control system now. Even for a manually controlled system, so if we have people doing the control, what has to happen in order to have control? What, is it, what does it mean to have control of any system? What's, what's the meaning of control? Yeah. Uh, some way to manage it. So we've got management. And you also said stop it. Yeah. So you will you want to be able to stop the system. What does it mean? All right, so is manage and control the same thing? Are they synonyms in this sense? Okay. So if we say manage or control, besides stop it, what do we have to do? Because we could stop it with a thermonuclear warhead. Right, we could totally stop it. And in fact, that system that deploys nuclear warheads, that has a control system, right? And that, that control system is made up of computer controls and human controls, we hope. And we hope there's control, yeah. So we have to monitor. No matter what we do, we have to monitor what's happening. And then what do we have to do? Yeah. We may want to do it again. Um, so anything that we're controlling, how do we control something? First step is monitor, right? After we've monitored, what do we have to do? We have to give instructions, right? We have to monitor, we have to instruct. 
So see what it is, see what the state is, give it instructions. See what the state is, give it instructions. See what the and so when we do that in a control sense, if we're observing the state and then giving some instruction, and then observing the state and giving some instruction again. Who is it? <laughs> if we're if we're controlling something, if we're monitoring the state, giving an instruction, monitoring the state, giving an instruction, monitoring the state, giving an instruction, then in in a control sense, what do we call that? Is that an open loop or a closed loop control system? It's closed loop because we're looking at the feed, we're and we're giving feedback, right? So we've we've got feedback. based on the current state, and then we take some action. Every control system, no matter what it's controlling, in order to control, it has to observe or monitor what the current state is. It has to take some action, then observe to see what that action resulted in. Is that true? True statement? All control systems. That's what it means to be a control system. Okay, so programmable logic controllers PLC programmable logic controllers. We understand what control means now, right? Well, controller is the device that does the controlling, right? Like in this class, at some level, I'm the controller because I get to decide your grades. I don't get to decide whether or not you come to the room, but at least I get to decide your grades. Um, programmable, we must believe means that we can change the way it controls stuff, right? I guess maybe we don't have to believe that we can change it. It could just mean that we program it once and it always does that. But uh, but in, in reality, I suppose it's reprogrammable because we can change how they act and we can use the same control unit and use it for many different situations and reconfigure it to do that. Okay. And so what logic? If we're going to talk about PLCs. We got to understand what all the words mean. Logic. What, is it, what does it mean to use logic? Deductive reasoning. So like Sherlock Holmes will deduce things. Um, so, so I think what logic means, actually, I have not done this ever. We're going to find out if I'm right. I think I know what logic means. Define logic. Reasoning. Reasoning conducted or assessed according to the strict principles of validity. Huh. Wait, wait, wait. I like number two better. A system or set of principles underlying the arrangements of elements in a computer, electronic state. I don't care about the computer. Um, let's see. The quality of being justified. Yeah, who cares? The course of action or line of reasoning suggested. I like a system or set of principles that divine, define the elements. Now, they say in a computer, but it doesn't have to be in a computer, right? Logic is when you perform some series of actions or you get to some series of conclusions through a specific set of rules. And as long as those rules are valid, then you always get the same answer if you have the same inputs. And so if you're controlling a factory, you'd like to have some valid logic so that every time you get the same inputs, you get the same outputs, right? Like in a computer program, they say garbage in, garbage out, right? But if sometimes you get different garbage, then that's going to be a problem. If you always get the same garbage out, you can figure out what the problem in the program is. 
If you get different garbage every time, then you have a problem. So logic means that we have a clearly defined set of rules. All right, so it's programmable. We can, we can tell it what to do. It uses logic, which means we have a defined set of rules, and it controls stuff. So in order to control stuff, we have to monitor, and we have to be able to give instructions, right? Which means we need to have input, and we have to have output. So in our PLC, we'll have an input rail. Now, it may not physically be located like this, but we will have an output. So if we're controlling a manufacturing process, what's going to be connected to the input side? Oh, and in here we have logic. Oops, can't spell. programmable. So we've got input and output. We've got programmable logic. What's the input have to be? Sensors. Go to the input. You said something, you said UI? Yeah. So user interface. So the user interface could be a light switch, right? So that's user interface because I did it by usering it, right? Over here, there's a PLC. Does it control the lights? No. Here I had some kind of user input by pressing the button on my little interface for what's probably Actually, you know, he's probably run some. I don't know if this is a PLC or not. Could be. You could totally build one of these things with a PLC. Um, I should find out before I do this lecture again, though, because it would be cool to know that. All right, so we've got sensors, we've got interface things, right? What what goes? What happens on the output side? What happens on the output side? Our manufacturing process. What are the kinds of things that we have on the output side? We could have lights. Now, what do lights usually do as part of a manufacturing process? Yeah. Indicate. I suppose if we're manufacturing marijuana plants, in the back room in our apartment, then maybe the lights are critical to the process. But I have a funny story about that, but I'm not going to tell it on camera. <laughs> um, indicator lights. <laughs> what else? What else do we have? What else? What else? What else? We're not. We all right. So we've indicated. What do we indicate? What are we going to do controlling our process? Let's say our process is a bottling facility. Let's say that we're bottling beer. Okay? So what's the process have to do to bottle beer? Let's, let's lay out some sensors. Or, or let's, let's, what, what, all right, what do we physically have to do to put beer in a bottle? What's the physical process? You guys all know about taking beer out of bottles, right? So reverse that. What's the physical process for putting beer in a bottle? Uh, we have to have a bottle. All right, you have to have a bottle. I got a bottle. Now what do I have to do? Yep. Pour the beer into the bottle. I have to dispense the beer into the bottle. So if my dispenser is here and my bottle's here, is it going to work? No. So I have to position the bottle at the dispenser. I have to know when it's positioned. I have to dispense. Then what? I have to stop dispensing before the bottle overflows, right? Right? I have to stop dispensing. Then what? I got a bottle of beer. If we lined up a bunch of college students at the end of the bottling line, we wouldn't have to do anything else, right? 
they could just they could stand in a line, they could rotate through, take their beer, drink it, and by the time they're done, they get to the end of the line. We could do that. I think <laughs> call the bottle. I mean, I'm sure if you pay the right fee, they will let you stand at the end of the bottling line. <laughs> Right, but uh, so then we then we move it out of the way, so we can bring in another bottle, right? And then we usually put a cap on it, unless we got college students. Uh, we'll put a cap on it, and then it'll go into some packaging area where it gets stacked up in the cases, right? Gets loaded on a truck, shows up down at uh, Highland Liquors. Okay, so we've got to do all that. So we've got to sense: is the bottle there? Is the bottle full? Right, we've got a sense, is the bottle there, is the bottle full? How do we move the bottle? We could use the college students again, get some freshmen. They can't drink the beer, but they can move the bottles, right? Uh, so we've got a conveyor belt. What makes the conveyor belt move? A control signal comes out, yes. What's the control signal do? Right, or it tells the motor to stop moving, right? So we control motors with PLCs. Now, frequently we tell the motor controller to control the motor with certain parameters. Um, the motor controller is a very specialized, sort of like PLC that can, does feedback control on the motor, mounted its position, things like that, if it's a servo motor. But so we tell motors to turn on and off. We tell indicator lights to turn on and off. We don't actually tell conveyors to turn on and off. What else could we do? What if you wanted that conveyor to keep moving all the time? You could fire a solenoid that juts out to stop the bottle, right? There's other things that you can do, right? So there's things that you could do to start and stop those motions. Um, Actually, another, in, uh, another place where we use PLCs, where lights are part of the process, is streetlight controls. So streetlights, where you got these are on, these are off, you got the walk signals, you got all those inputs and stuff, those are controlled by a PLC. A PLC operates those functions. Okay, so inputs, outputs, logic. Are you guys in lab? Lab's ready to go, Ryan? Lab's ready to go all in 105, in the back room, eight computers, all functioning, checked them all, okay. It's not that I don't trust the IT, but I don't trust the IT. All right, so in lab this week, you're going to have um, the opportunity to go through a series of structured exercises where you will learn how to program PLCs. You will specifically learn how to program a particular model of Allen Bradley PLCs, because that's the one we have the simulator software for. Um, it doesn't matter that it's that particular form of Allen Bradley PLC. All PLCs basically work the same. You may learn a different computer interface if you're programming a different kind of PLC. You may learn some slightly different syntax in the programming if you're programming a different kind of PLC. Who's programmed with PLC before? None of you. Who's like emulated programming a PLC before? That's possible. Nope, nobody. Okay. All right, let's talk about how the programming works. But PLCs basically has inputs, outputs, and then logic to decide what to do. Has everybody had something like double E for dummies or one of those classes where you do all circuit diagrams? Everybody's had some class like that. Do they still call it double E for dummies? Volts for dolts? Yeah, okay. Just checking. <coughs> so let's, uh, let's do a, a simple circuit diagram where we have a switch and a light and a power source. Can somebody do that? I need a volunteer. Somebody draw... 
a switch, a light, no. All right. Is it is it like a symbol for the power source? Is it like like the battery thing, like this, something like that? Yeah. Okay. It, it, so this would be DC power. Okay. Sounds good. And so I come here. I come here. I go over here. Is that a resistor? Okay. Because the light is basically, a, is there a different way to draw like a resistor? A resistor with like a bulb around it or something? It's like Valentine's Day, so I almost drew a heart instead of a light bulb. All right, there's my light. This is why I'm an engineer, not an artist. All right, and so what happens when we close the switch? Yeah. Light turns on. Or I saw a really cool YouTube video where if you did this with the battery and the switch and no resistor, the whole thing catches on fire. It was actually really cool. If you like search on YouTube for, um, I don't know, you could figure out the search terms. I was looking for a really good um, example video or, or picture of why we use a relay. Why, do, why is it we use a relay? So that we can have a, a low voltage signal control a high voltage or, or, or low power signal control a high power output thing, right? So the headlights on your car draw a lot of current. You wouldn't want to have all that current come to the dashboard through a switch and then back out in case there was a short circuit or something. You'd catch the car on fire inside. You'd rather catch the fire car on fire outside, right, if there was a short circuit. So there's a little switch on your dashboard or your steering column, wherever it is. That actually just sends a signal to a relay, which then kicks in a contactor, which turns the headlights on. I was looking, I figured there had to be a good picture of like the dashboard of some car burnt up because somebody tried to wire it the other way. But I guess those people don't live long enough to take pictures. <laughs> All right, so we close the switch, light turns on, right? Or the whole thing catches on fire if there's not enough resistance. All right, let's do this with a PLC. Input. Input. We'll call this number one. We only need one, right? But we could have like 40 inputs if we wanted, 20 inputs, whatever. Right now, let's call this one number one. I can't remember. The board you're using probably has eight inputs, eight outputs on each module, but then you can add as many modules as you need. Um, logic. Programmable. Output. We use number one over here too. We could actually have the input number one over here connect to the output number eight over here. Doesn't matter. We could just tell the logic. All right. So, what do we want to do in words here? If input number one is closed, turn on output number one. Does that make sense? So the light is connected here. And the switch is connected here. Is that enough, do you think? Yeah, yeah. So this is going to have some sort of a common. that goes out here, right? And this is gonna have, so 
So some way, and, and so we don't see this, but it's got to be there's like our battery, our DC power source, right? Connected here and connected over here. And there's some little switch in here, right? So when we operate this output thing, it basically closes a little switch, right? And we, so we could, we could design this with relays, right? So if this light draws a lot of power, like a lot of power is like when we do this, right? We have more power now because we have more cells in our battery. So this here could be something that opens and closes because that output opened and closed. That turns the light on, right? We have to go around like that. So we do it, we could add a relay in there or a motor starter or something like that. It's in there outside. Okay. So when we turn the switch off, what happens? Only if we tell it to, right? So if off, I'm off. All right, let's um, let's look at it as if we were writing the program now. So that's what we want to do. If the switch is on, we want to turn on output number one. Switch is off, we want to turn off output number one. And so we do PLC programming. We use what we call ladder logic. And the rung of a ladder simply looks like this. That's the rung of a ladder. We can have as many rungs as we want, depending on how many different things we want to control. There's an input side on the rung. There's an output side on the rung. So that's the symbol for a normally open switch. That's the symbol for an output coil. Now they call it an output coil because it's modeled on doing this relay logic. And so in a relay, the way you turn the contactor on and off is a coil that moves like a, you know, like an electromagnet kind of coil. It shoots a little thing over, like a little solenoid or something. So inside the relays, they do that. You've heard relays click on and off, right? Some of them are pretty loud. Sometimes if they get in the state where they're turning on and off really fast, it like buzzes. That's usually just before they catch on fire. All right, so we've got an output. Well, we physically wire it. We've got to have some common going back to that light also. And so this output will supply the power to the light unless the power is above a above the amperage rating of the output. If it's above the amperage rating of the output, you put a relay in between. And you have an external power source. OK. So if this is our entire rung, our entire ladder, Oh, and here's our button, right? So here's our switch. Here's our button. And here's our light. It was over here. This comes over to the the DC power source, and that's back into the PLC. OK, so I close the switch. Light stays on, right? Because if the switch is closed, output one is on. I open the switch. It reads the ladder, it reads the rung on the ladder again. If the switch is open, the output one is off. So when the switch is closed, output one is on. When the switch is open, output one is off. If output one is on, closed, this circuit is complete. If output one is open, the circuit is closed. OK? Every time. Let's do another rung.
This is a symbol for a normally closed switch. So if we don't operate the button, then this will just be a closed line. So this is number one. This is number one. Number two, this is input number two. Number two. So, in this one, if we operate the switch, it breaks the signal. So, we got light one, physical light one. Let's. All right, so in the case where I operate switch one and I operate switch two, so I hold both switches closed with my hands, what happens? Yep. Uh, light one turns on and light two turns off. Light one is on, light two is off. Okay. And if I leave switch to off, right? So you guys got that. It's normally open, normally closed. Okay. Now, I don't have to have a separate rung here. So I could have like a little sub rung here. All right, I'm holding both switches. What happens? So this is consider this to be an electrical contact. So I'm holding both switches right now. What happens? Both lights are on. Because here I've got oh this this could have been either way. Even if that was two, both of them are on. So I can have the same physical input connected to, to switch one. So I can have the same physical input. You don't have to change the operation of the switch in order to have it have the reverse effect. You do it in the logic in the PLC. Now I need fewer components, right? I don't have to have some switches that, that operate one way and some switches that operate the other way. So that already made our, our industrial automation cheaper because I could fix it in the programming. All right. So this is this is or. I hold both switches. What happens? Light two is on, light one is off. Because when I operate switch two, it breaks this. So this is and. So in this case, in order to turn light one on, I cannot have my hand on switch two. So you get how the logic is starting to go here. We can do ands and ors. Now they have timers. Oh, here's something that's really cool. Let's do a latching circuit. Right. But it doesn't matter what the physical configuration of the physical switch is. I'm just saying, so what happens, in, and so this is actually kind of, kind of important to note. What happens when the PLC starts to run the program, and so it, and the PLC runs the program, Indefinitely, it loops indefinitely until you turn it off. 
or until you give it a command to tell it to stop. So it does that. So when it gets to the start of an instance of a loop, it checks the state of all the inputs. It checks the state of all the outputs, and it records that in its internal table. Then it reads the logic, and it implements the logic as it goes through. It finishes that loop. It goes back to the top. It checks the state of all the inputs. It checks the state of all the outputs. Then it reads the logic. Um, a moderately long PLC program, it takes about 50 milliseconds to do one of those loops. That's pretty fast. Um, so here we go. All right. We've got. So here, I close the switch, light turns on. I let go of the switch, light turns off, right? This is I1. This is O1. And now we need to be careful whether we're talking about output ones or input ones. Because it matters if it's an output or an input. But the PLC reads the state of the inputs. It reads the state of the outputs. Puts those in its table. So it knows the state of output one when it finishes the loop. So if I treat the state of output one as an input, when I push it down, the light turns on. If I'm still holding it down by the time it starts the next loop 50 milliseconds later, it sees that it's on. And now I can let go of it. And it stays on because this is an output, or this is a latch. So now it latches that light on. And so if we wanted to turn that off, maybe we'd have a, let's see, switch one and switch two. Huh. It's been a long time since I did this. Try to remember the symbol to tell it to turn output one off. There's a symbol. You'll learn it when you do the. Um, you'll learn it. <clears throat> Set the output bit to zero. There's a symbol. It's in the book. You'll learn it when you get there. But there's a thing over here that if we press both of these switches, it will turn that off. If you press one switch, it'll turn it on. So you can command the bit. So and, and so these are just bits in a lookup table. It's either a one or a zero. Um, so when it reads that table, it's either on or it's off. Inside the PLC, when they, they, they when they first built them, it's just a bunch of transistors. So you have the state on or off, and that that's what you could do with a transistor. That's what you could do in 1969 when you built one of these programmable logic controllers. Um, there's timers, so you can have it stay in this state until the timer runs out. You can have a latching circuit that pulls in the timer so it stays in that state, and then there's a delay when you unlatch the latching circuit of like five seconds or whatever it is. Um, timers, you can have it do math. You can do fairly, fairly complicated math. So if this is this and this is this, and then you could have it read an analog input. So there's, these are all digital inputs and outputs, right, that we're talking about. You can have it read analog inputs, and you can have it measure voltage and measure amperage, things like that, so that it can control complex systems. Um, there are motor controller boards that go in the PLC hardware. So your motor controller could be you know, a few centimeters away from your logic controller. Um, what else, PLCs? Why use a PLC instead of a PC? Maybe. More reliable. Uh, because of the way it does the ladders also, it makes it very simple to debug the program. Um, it's also way less complex than using a couple computers to jump 
the, you don't need to use the whole computer system. That's why if you look inside CNC machine tools, if you look inside robots, inside the guts of the controller is actually a PLC. Almost none of them are, they may interface with a PC. And the PC may be what supplies you with the user interface. But the guts of what makes the motors move is a PLC. Um, and this, is, this has been true for long, 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 long times. Understanding these PLCs, understanding how the ladder logic works, even if you never directly interact with one later in your career, understanding how that works is going to help you be a better engineer. Uh, so we're going to spend this week in lab using our PLC emulator software. That way everybody, well, every group, um, that way every group can have their own PLC to play with. And you will be doing things like turning lights on and off, opening and closing garage doors, running a um, running like a four-way traffic intersection. Try, try not to kill anybody. <laughs> you don't want to have green on in two directions at once, for example. You don't have all the greens on and the walk si signals on. Try not to kill anybody. Um, this PLC is in an hour, or 40 minutes or whatever we spent. If you'd like to know more, I have taught 40 hour long classes on PLCs where we actually build PLC boards and setups. And you know those, I mean, right now you know enough that if you had the reference book that had all the symbols, you could understand what a PLC program does. Because you understand enough about the logic. At the, well, unless you nobody was asleep. I think you guys got it. So right now you can do that. Um, mostly what we do in a 40 hour long PLC class is we teach you how to troubleshoot an existing program. So let's just think about how do you troubleshoot an existing program. So there's two, there's two cases here, right? There's one where you just created the program and you don't know if it works. And there's two, the bottling line was running fine and then the bottle stopped getting to the fill line before it put, started putting the beer in, right? And if you've got the line of college students there, there's no problem because they just do this. Right, but if you actually have to put the bottles in a box before you can get them to the college students, you have a problem. So, what do you have to consider if you're going to troubleshoot one of these systems? Anybody ever read about the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor incident? So, and I may have the details mixed up. It was a long time ago that I read about it. Um, but when I read about it, I worked at a nuclear power plant, and so we were like getting detailed details about it. Um, there, uh, there was a, a valve at the top of the reactor that controlled coolant water. And they had an indicator light in the control room. Right? We had indicator lights. An indicator light in the control room that the controllers believed indicated the position of the valve. Now what that light indicated was the position of the switch telling the valve what position to be in. It did not indicate the position of the valve. They didn't have a sensor on the valve that noted the position. They, had a, they used their PLC. It was a PLC problem, and it was totally PLC programming that screwed it up, that almost caused the reactor to melt down. They had an indicator of the position of the switch. They had commanded the valve to open or close. I can't remember what the problem was. I think it was, it was a drain valve. They had commanded it to close. It stuck. They were losing coolant out of the reactor. That's bad, by the way, in reactors. You don't want to lose the coolant. Coolant keeps them from getting out of control. So they're losing coolant. And they're trying to figure out, why are we losing coolant? Well, let's check the drain valve. Nope, drain valve's closed. Why are we losing coolant? And they're trying to run through all these other scenarios about why they were losing coolant. Finally, somebody went out and noted the position of the valve. And said, hey, the valve is not closed. And then they manually close the valve, and that's what saved it. So let's troubleshoot our broken PLC system. I, I've got, I don't have all the details, but that's roughly, roughly what happened. I do know that the root cause was the, the indicator light indicated the position of the switch, not the position of the valve. Let's troubleshoot our PLCs. What could be wrong? Bottle's not getting to the filler, but the filler's operating. All right, so if you assumed you knew how frequently the bottles were going to be there and you programmed with a timer to have it operate at a certain interval, which would be an easy way to do it, cheap way to do it, right? 
Okay, that could be it. Yeah. Okay, the motor for the conveyor belt could be not driving the bottle, the next bottle there. But what should we do before we turn on the filler? We should check to make sure there's a bottle there, right? So let's say we have a sensor that checks to make sure there's a bottle in the right place before we turn on the filler, because that would be the smart thing to do. Um, <coughs> what could be wrong? It could just check and not do anything about it. The sensor could be malfunctioning, right? The wiring between the sensor and the control unit could have a short in it. So if the sensor, when the sensor detects a signal that closes a switch, and you're detecting at the PLC that the switch is closed, it could also be a short circuit, right? That would also tell the PLC that the switch is closed. So it could be the wiring between the sensor and the PLC. Um, what else could it be? Oh, it could be the program is wrong, right? But if the program was working, and then it stops working, here's here's what the engineers or the the electricians in the field tend tend to believe: the bottling line's not working right. Must be the engineer that programmed the PLC screwed up. Here's what it usually is: the bottling line's not working right. Perhaps the engineer programming the PLC could have had more redundancy in the program, but it's probably a broken sensor. It's probably a broken wire. It's probably a broken. Maybe it's maybe it's the the fill timer is wrong, right? Maybe there's something uh, like physically wrong, and so uh, so you have to go out in the field, check the physical components, check to see are these things working. If you understand the PLC programming, you can know how to operate the switch, and then look at the PLC and say, did it turn on or off, right? So you can check the wiring pretty quick. So this is, we'll spend 40 hours doing that, troubleshooting it. Um, if the indicator light's not on, what does it mean? Means the indicator light's not on. That's all it means. Could be a bad light bulb. Could be the light bulb not screwed in all the way. Could be you're not telling it to turn on right. Um, I'll leave you with one thought. You're at a stoplight. There's a car in front of you. The right side taillight is flashing. What do you know? Yeah. You probably infer that their right blinker's on. It's possible the hazard lights are on and the left is broken. What you know is that sometimes that filament lights up. <laughs> right? That's what you know. All the rest of it, we're guessing. All right. Uh, and that was something that Dick Morley, who invented the PLC, he, he taught me that. When, I mean, of course, it makes 100% sense when somebody says it, but I had never thought of it until he said it. So that's my one Dick Morley story for today. All you know is that that filament works sometimes. It could be they're standing on the brakes, and all the brake lights are out except for that one, which sometimes works because there's a vibration, and sometimes it makes a connection inside the light. There is one nice thing about morning classes is when you start, the blackboard's clean. <laughs>